So people, we start the session now and uh, a warm welcome to all of you. I will just give you a summary of uh, the, the questions that came in CAT 2017. Many of you must be aware of that, that in CAT 17, we had uh, questions from uh, from para jumbles, from theta, para, uh, from from odd sentences, from from uh, reading comprehension. That goes without saying. And we had questions from summary as well. And uh, we never know uh, what kind of distribution we might have. And the summary questions are coming in the mocks as well. And I feel that summary questions is one of the easier verbal ability uh, verbal ability categories. So there is a definite way of you know approaching that question. So I would just lay out the the the, the process of uh, tackling these questions. Just a moment. So people, when we start here, uh, I would uh, I would I, I would just lay down certain important critical points that you must keep in mind uh, while solving questions from summary. Now I always tell everyone that you must create a process. Uh, for solving a question so whenever you have a process for solving a question it it basically shows that you approach the question in a particular way for example when you are approaching summary questions you have to first how to basically what is summary all about so in in the fir the first thing in summary is that you capture critical points that is very important you always capture critical points in the sense that if any of the options is missing any of the critical points then that is not the right choice so in summary you capture critical points secondly you ignore less important things otherwise what happens basically is you are reproducing the summary or uh, the passage itself so for example if my passage has six sentences and my summary option also has six sentences then how can I say that this is the summary of what is given to me? In other words, my suggestion is that your summary usually should be shorter than the than the passage that is given to you. So many a time, one of the reasons why we have shorter summaries are shorter than the actual paragraph, because while making summaries, you ignored less important points and you captured the critical points. But if you end up capturing everything, then the summary would be would be of, of the same uh, nature as the given passage. So this is very important that you capture the critical points. It is equally important that you ignore the less important points. That is how you will have a summary. Otherwise, summary, summary is not possible. The third thing is don't add anything. Un, don't add anything from your end. Most of the options will have something which is extraneous. What do you mean by extraneous? Something which is not there in the passage, but you have added it from your end. Now that is not correct. Because when you add something extraneous from your end, you are basically putting in something which is, you know, not given anywhere in the passage. And secondly, the fourth and the most important thing is don't misinterpret. So I would, I would, take all the questions that have come in the previous year CAT papers and through those questions I would demonstrate all these four points. Uh, look at this question now, the twelfth question. Everyone please attempt the question and tell me what is the right answer. Keeping all those four points in mind, please try to attempt the question. So, so when I go through this question, it says North American walnut swings moth caterpillars look like easy meals for birds but they have a trick up their sleeves they, they they produce whistles that sound like bird alarm calls scaring potential predators away so this is the first sentence it speaks about what north american walnut sphinx and it says that they have a trick up their sleeves they produce whistles so okay they produce whistles it sounds like bird alarm calls scaring predators away at first scientists suspected birds were simply startled by loud music but a new study suggests a more sophisticated mechanism. The caterpillar's whistle appears to mimic a bird alarm call, sending avian predators scrambling for cover. When pecked by a bird, the caterpillars whistle by compressing their bodies like an accordion and forcing air through specialized holes in their sides. The whistles are impressively loud. They have been they have been measured at over 50 decibels from 5 centimeters away from the caterpillar considering they are made by a 2 inch long insect so what do we get from these uh, from from these sentences it says that north american walnut sphinx looks like easy meal because they have uh, 
but they have a trick up their sleeves the author says at first scientists suspected birds were simply startled and then they found there was a sophisticated mechanism the mechanism has been given here right and let's so let's go to the so this is a long passage it's not a short passage and now let's have a look at the options and now the first step is to read the passage and get the critical points now you might ask sir how do we know what are the critical points the first thing is that the passage is about walnut sphinx and the second thing is it is about their whistle and the third thing is that the whistle drives predators away and then they say how it what happens basically how it is done and then the whistle has been based so this whole passage is about the whistle of north american walnut sphinx and i must go and have a look at the options now to arrive at the right answer north american walnut sphinx moth caterpillars will whistle periodically to ward off predators so it has the elements they whistle and they have a specialized vocal tract that helps them whistle north american walnut sphinx can whistle very loudly so they will whistle periodically they will whistle very loudly so what have i done i have pointed out the differences between the options this says whistle periodically this says whistle very loudly the loudness of their whistles is shocking as they are very small insects so periodically whistle very loudly and then c says the north american walnut sphinx in 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 a case of acoustic deception produce whistles that mimic bird alarm calls to defend themselves so this is basically an impo- a point that has come which is not there in b so a says periodically b says whistle very loudly c says the whistle loudly to defend themselves and d says north american walnut sphinx uh, in a case of deception and camouflage so now i have picked the points of difference what is the first point of difference periodically so is it anywhere given that they are whistling periodically and yes people is the whistle periodically or not periodically and secondly is it about specialized vocal tract because none of the options have given vocal tract understand people i am trying to find the difference between the options and that is the best way to arrive at the answer this speaks of vocal tract there is no vocal tract in b there is no vocal tract in c there is no vocal tract in d so is it really about vocal tract if you look at the entire paragraph i don't see anywhere vocal tract and secondly the whistles are loud not because of the vocal tract but it is basically coming from uh, it is it is coming from uh, uh, compressing their bodies and not the vocal tract that means option a goes out because vocal tract is an additional information right camouflage is an additional information there is nowhere camouflage given in fact mimicking the sound is not a camouflage camouflage is with colors with respect to color so even d goes out so i am left with b and c b- are you getting my point so camouflage is out vocal tract is out now we have two options b and c both b and c are very close but if you look at c c says to defend themselves which is a very very camouflage is to hide or deceive but people understand camouflage is always with respect to, to colors you use color to deceive not sound so it goes out so we are left with b and c and we find that c is the best choice why because to defend themselves is a very very important purpose of this paragraph that is to defend oneself the whole mechanism of whistling is done with the single purpose of what defending themselves so can i say c is the best choice out of all the given choices cows acoustic deceptions here if you look at this here they have a trick up their sleeve understand this people they have a trick up their sleeve so this is basically where you know they have a trick up their sleeve no no b is not covering the most important point and that is to defend themselves you have to compare b and c people you will find that north american defend is one. so everyone has given c and now if you mark c then you have done the right thing because because you have this this was an easy question and i think that most of you should have got it right it says a fundamental property of language is that it is slippery and messy and more liquid than solid a gelatinous mass that changes shape to fit so from this i get to know that it is basically flexible language is flexible so whenever i read something 
it is very important that I codify that in my language to simplify the entire thing. Simplification is done in mathematics. Simplification should also be done in verbal aptitude. And the best way of simplification is whenever you see a long sentence, just try to codify it. Language is primarily flexible and not, not, not static. Wittgenstein would remind us usage has no sharp boundary. Oftentimes, the only way to determine the meaning of a word is to examine how it is used. This insight is often described as meaning in use doctrine. That means basically how it is used and not the definition. There are differences between the meaning in use doctrine and a dictionary first theory of meaning. The dictionary's careful fixing of words can suggest that this is how language works. The definitions can seem to ensure and fix the meaning of words. What Wittgenstein found in the circulation of ordinary language, however, was a free floating currency. The value of each word arises out of the exchange. The lexicographer abstracts a meaning from that exchange, which is then set within the conventions of the dictionary definition. So what exactly is the author? See, you have to read it twice if you haven't understood. There, there are two things going on. The first thing is the passage is about language. And the second thing is what about language then? That the meaning of language is not static, but it is fluid or it is flexible. And the second thing the author has used is the word dictionary. So he says the dictionary is careful fixing can suggest that is how language works. Right. But Wilson sign said that there is a free floating currency of meaning. The value of each word arises out of the exchange and the lexicographer abstracts a meaning from that exchange. That means the dictionary basically is, is uh, it gives us the meaning based on what the fluid nature of language. So whenever I read something, I have to check what exactly is the main topic of the paragraph. And then secondly, out of that of uh, I mean, I mean uh, from that main main topics perspective, what is the author trying to communicate? So once I have codified everything in bits and pieces, I should go and try to mark the answer. Dictionary definitions are like gold standards, artificial, theoretical and dogmatic. Actual words is in their free exchange. Looks very good. They are like gold standards, you know, artificial. But then my point is artificial, theoretical and dogmatic. These words I feel are a little too far fetched when it comes to what is given in the paragraph. Right. So because they are far fetched, I will check until I see a better option. Language is already slippery. So slippery is fine. Given this accounting for meaning in use will only act. meaning in use will not exasperate the problem. In fact, meaning is used the right thing. So this has to go out because this goes against what is given in the passage. Then I come to see meaning is dynamic. The author says definitions are static. The meaning in use theory helps us understand that definitions of words are curled or obtained from their meaning and not vice versa. So precisely what is given in the paragraph. Yes, exaggerated and extraneous into option is A. Yes, right. I mean, A is exaggerated. And then when I go to option uh, C is the right choice. And then I will, when I go to D, the meaning of words in dictionaries is clear. It is not that the meaning of word is clear and less dangerous. Where is the dangerous part coming in? Where is the ambiguity part coming in? So I feel that most of the words in option D are not fitting in the context. And this question becomes an easy question where C is the right choice. So you have to ensure people that the first thing is you have to understand the passage. You have to get the crux of it and then do the comparison of the options to arrive at the right answer. This will basically work in most of the cases. We call this as the process of arriving at the right answer. Right, people? So now we, we go and take one more questions here and that is the 16th question. Please take this question now. These are all cat questions which came last year. So we are actually doing what came last year and that is a, there's a good experience for you. So we have got the first answer from Rahul and he has given us the answer as C. And uh, now let's let's read this because I think uh, uh, people like you have gone through the, the, uh, the question and now let's try to find the answer here. It says a translator of literary work needs a secure hold upon the two languages involved supported by a good measure of familiarity within the two cultures. So the author says so in the first sentence speaks about what a translator of literary works needs a good hold upon the two languages. 
and he says that should be supported by uh, by by a good measure of familiarity with two cultures fine for an indian translating works in an indian language into english finding satisfactory equivalence in a generalized western culture of practices and symbols in the original would be less difficult than gaining fluent control of contemporary english so what do you say it's, it's a long sentence How, what do you get from it it says that for an indian finding satisfactory equivalent in a generalized western culture of practices and symbols would be less difficult than gaining fluent control of english so basically something is less difficult for an indian and then the author says when a westerner works on texts in indian languages the interpretation of cultural elements will be major challenge rather than the control of grammar and essential vocabulary so what do i get from these sentences the first thing is about translator translating what a literary work the author says for indian translating works in indian languages finding satisfactory equivalent in a generalized western culture of practices would be less difficult so then gaining fluent control so basically for an indian language would be more difficult and finding satisfactory equivalent would be less difficult when a westerner works on texts he will have more command on the language but the interpretation of cultural elements will be major challenge it is much easier to remedy lapses in language than flaws in content the author says that it is easier to remedy what flaws in language since it is easier for an indian to learn english language than it is for a briton or american to comprehend indian culture translations of indian texts is better left to india so what do you get from all these sentences the paragraph speaks about translation first of all and then he says you know that there are translation has two things one is culture and the other is language the author says language can be learned easily he says right that westerner would have comfort with language the indian would have comfort with culture why because he is born in that culture and then he says it is easier to remedy mistakes in language than flaws of content flaws of content through what through basically misunderstanding of culture it is easier for an indian to learn the english language than it is for britain to comprehend indian culture and therefore text should be better left to indians so what is the whole summary that because indians are more familiar with the culture of india indian text should be translated into english by uh, by indians and not by other people so this is more or less what the passage when i am decoding the passage i will have a i will have a better command over it so my suggestion to to you all is that first of first of all you have to read and understand what exactly is the passage trying to communicate now when i come to the options i have to compare the options see what exactly is going on while translating the indian and the westerner face the same challenge do they face the same challenges in fact the western is facing the cultural challenge indian is facing what the challenge of language so definitely option a is the first one to go out so even if you haven't understood this very clearly from the initial two impressions from the two readings you can say that the author is not talking about the same challenge in fact he is highlighting different set of challenges as preserving cultural meanings is the essence of literary translation indians knowledge of the local culture outweighs the initial disadvantage of lower fluency in english might sound like a good option so i will shortlist this at least it is uh, it is not having any issues i mean apparently we'll go to see now indian translators should translate indian texts into english as their work is less likely to pose cultural problems which are harder to address than the quality of language looks very good so both b and c sound good to me so i will just hold them westerners might be good at gaining reasonable fluency in new languages how many languages are you speaking about i don't i don't see that the author has given that they have greater there is nowhere in the passage mentioned that they are good at gaining reasonable fluency in new languages it is an alien information i don't see the way the same challenges has come in option a and made me kick out option a similarly the new languages in option d makes me kick out option d i will not look at it why because i the moment i see the new languages because this westerners has come in the paragraph fluency also has come but this is fluency in what in the english language see the language is english language is english so either it is english or either it is foreign languages i mean new languages so i immediately have kicked out d now i have to choose from b and c 
and then as preserving cultural meanings is the essence of literary translation indians knowledge of local culture outweighs the initial disadvantage of lower fluency looks good but this is incomplete why it is incomplete because the problem is that indian translators should translate indian text this conclusion is very important this comparison should translate goes to show that we should translate the other should not translate the point is not about simply you know preserving cultural meanings uh, you know is the essence of this in fact it says here indian translator should translate see this is basically capturing the purpose of the passage also is a better choice understand this people i am just not writing things for ob uh, uh, objectively the author says that because addressing uh the cultural issues are far more difficult than addressing the language issues the translation should be le left to indian yes it is an important point look at the last part it says since it is easier to, for an indian to learn the english language uh, than for a briton or american to comprehend in culture translations should be left to indians i mean this is very important that's why indian translators should translate so this point which is missing in option b is a very very important point which i think is basically the entire you know the highlight of the passage so ariman says he remembered marking b but so i hope you have got this lesson why c is better than b it's a good question that it says here that indian translators should translate indian texts into english as their work is less less likely means less likely to pose cultural problems because indians have because it is see it is not it is not can see understand the the conclusion is basically the whole highlight of the passage so if you are summarizing the passage understand this the author says first that culture is important this is what he says culture aspect of a book is important the language aspect is not important this is what he says in the first part so this entire paragraph has two parts the first part is basically saying that culture is more important language is less important because language can anyways be addressed culture is less difficult to uh, more difficult to address and therefore when it comes to indian texts it's better that indian who are familiar with the culture should translate that so what it does basically see basically says that indian translator should translate why so this why has come in first part of the paragraph why should indians translate texts into english because their work is less likely to pose cultural problems because they are familiar with the culture and the author says these cultural problems are harder to address than the quality of language so this second part of the option has come in the first part of the paragraph and the first part of the uh, of the option has come in the last part of the paragraph and the entire paragraph is about what culture and language and then who should basically get the preference this is what we mean by summary take the 17th question now answer is the right answer right so it says for each of the past 3 years temperatures have hit peaks not seen since the birth of meteorology and probably not for more than 110000 years the amount of carbon dioxide in the air is at its highest level in 4 million years this does not cause storms like harvey there have always been storms and hurricanes along the gulf of mexico but it makes them wetter and more powerful as the seas warm they evaporate more easily and provide energy to storms as the air above them warms it holds more water vapor for every half a degree celsius in warming there is about a 3 degree increase in the atmospheric moisture content scientists call this clausius kelkleperen equation this means the skies fill more quickly and have more to dump the storm surge was greater because sea levels have risen 20 cm as a result of more than 100 years of human related global warming which has melted so it's a long paragraph but when i read it for the first time i get a feeling it's about temperatures about meteorology so i uh, it's sorry it's, it's about temperatures about 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 osh uh, the the storms like harvey and something and so on and so forth so i will just have a look at it again it says here you know yes the equation is also important so it says here the temperatures have hit peaks the amount of carbon dioxide is as 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 is at its highest this does not cause storms like harvey 
it makes them wetter and then it explains how it becomes wet the sea is warm they evaporate and for every half a degree there is three increase moisture content and this is basically so there is wetter and why it is wetter is given here this means skies fill more quickly so basically why it is wetter is the, the second part of the paragraph so initially the first part has been given and that is what that it becomes wetter and more powerful and the second part explains how it becomes wetter and powerful so i can divide this entire paragraph in two parts the second part explains the bet, uh, the 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 wetter and the more powerful part uh, 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 the idea of the paragraph and the first part explains why the temperatures have hit peaks and so on and so forth so when i come here it says here that the storm harvey is one of the regular annual ones from the gulf of mexico uh, it is not even speaking about the wetter and all those aspects i mean it is just not capturing anything in the passage the first one to go out is option a and then d says it is naive to think that rising sea levels and the force of tropical storms are unrelated i i don't know who said it is naive to think naiveness is not given anywhere so this is an additional information harvey was destructive as global warming has armed it with more moisture content but this may not be true of all storms i don't know whether all storms has come or not it is nowhere in the passage so i will not choose d why because all storms have not been mentioned so when i when when i come to a and d i can easily eliminate both a and d now the point is out of b and c which is better global warming does not breed storms but makes them more destructive so this is given here this is basically the whole idea the clausius clapeyron equation though it predicts a potential increase in atmosphere moisture content cannot predict the scale of damage uh is the scale of damage uh, i mean uh, is the point that the clausius equation cannot predict the damage and is damage i mean has damage come i mean it uh, with the the point that it is not able to predict the damage has that been anywhere the highlight of the so out of nothing i have to mark c global warming melts glaciers resulting in sea water volume expansion this enables more water and this entire thing is called clausius clapeyron equation many of you might feel that where is the equation the equation is nothing but what is given in the first sentence of the of the summary global warming melts glacier resulting in sea water volume expansion this enables more water and what is this called as this is called as clapeyron equation so it is so whether i mention clapeyron equation or whether i explain clapeyron equation it is one and the same thing whether i say that the current running through the through the wire is proportional to the voltage applied and the resistance in the in the wire or i can say simply ohm's law there is no need for me to mention both ohm's law and also the entire description of the law so the point c has two things the first part is the clapeyron equation and the second part is modern storms contain more destructive energy modern storms refers to what it says here it says storms like harvey that means basically you know harvey is not the focus of the paragraph i mean harvey is just an example so out of all the given choices i have option c is the best choice what can i do i have to mark c and go ahead there is no point finding flaws in the option yes yeah correct the the illustration should not be the point of contention the point of contention should be what is that is what we mean by summary the summary is that uh, we have to ensure that the marketing activity is done in this way and what are the different marketing activities we should not bother about it I mean, there are all, all the different you know elaboration should not be a point the crux of the matter is the important point if you are missing the crux of the matter you are missing basically the question none of the mock questions are anywhere close to what these questions are i am telling you very honestly so if you are ignoring cat questions you are ignoring the i mean you are ignoring cat actually and let's let's discuss the answer now correct now people let's let's go ahead and see what exactly has the passage to say right it says here that to me a classic means precisely the opposite of what my predecessors understood a work is classical by reason of its resistance to contemporaneity and supposed universality by reason of its capacity to indicate human particularity and difference in the past epoch so it says it to be a classic means precisely the opposite of what my predecessors understood so after the colon it is given what the predecessors understood 
A work is classical by by reason of its resistance to contemporaneity and supposed universality. That means the predecessors thought that a works a works universality means what? It is a classic. The classic is not what tells me about shared humanity, or more truthfully, I put what lets me recognize myself as already present in the past. What nourishes in me the illusion that everything has been like me and has existed only to prepare the way for me. Instead. He says the classic is what gives access to radically different forms of human consciousness for any given generation of readers, and thereby expands for them the range of possibilities of what it means to be a human being. So the author has given two things in the paragraph. See, understand? We have to basically break everything. He says what a classic is for others and for me. So precisely, the focus is what exactly a classic means to the author, and he says that instead the classic is what gives access to radically different forms of human consciousness. He says the classic is not what tells about shared humanity or about universality. It is about what radically different forms of human consciousness. So when I look at the paragraph, I must find something similar. A classic is able to focus on the contemporary human condition. and an unified experience of human consciousness but the author says it is not unified experience it says here right the classic is not what tells me about shared humanity that means basically shared human so so unified experience and shared experience is what the author would disagree with and therefore a goes out focus on common humanity is not what the author see shared humanity unified consciousness common humanity they all will go out a classic is a work exploring the new going beyond the universal and the notion of unified human consciousness so there should be no unified human consciousness so this looks a very good choice now it says here going beyond the universal look at it is given here it says here right the classic is what gives access to radically different forms of human consciousness so dif dif radically different basically means what going beyond universal universal means general so this is the universal thing but when i say going beyond general basically means what radically different so you have to understand that this is this is suggested by the passage option c is the best choice i hope i hope you are getting this people see you have to understand the intricacies it is said that it is said that uh it gives access to radically different forms of human consciousness and radically different forms of human consciousness basically means no 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 radically different is basically what going beyond the universal going beyond the universal going beyond the notion of unified consciousness that means what are you doing you are exploring the new the new means what radically different and d says a classic is a work that provides access to universal no 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 he is against universal experience so in fact option d option b option a they all speak about what common humanity universal experience and unified but the author is against these he says that i should get access to what radically different forms it says here right it says instead the classic is what what gives access to radically different forms of consciousness for any given generation and thereby extends for them the range of possibilities so range of possibilities means what you know the different discrete human experiences and not a unified experience we we'll find that look at this here it says both socrates and bacon were very good at asking useful questions in fact socrates is largely credited with coming up with a with a way of asking questions the socratic method which itself is at the core of the scientific method popularized by bacon the socratic method disproves arguments by finding exceptions to them and can therefore lead your opponent to a point where they admit something that contradicts their original position in common with socrates bacon stressed it was as important to disprove a theory as it was to prove one and real world observation and experimentation were key to achieving both aims bacon also saw science as a collaborative affair with scientists working together challenging each other so this is where you know the entire thing comes so when i read this it says about bacon and socrates and all the options have bacon socrates bacon socrates bacon socrates right and they had something common this is what i get from the paragraph they were not you know 
they were not basically in opposing camps they were in the same camp so so they were good at asking useful questions and then uh, socrates is largely credited with coming up with a way of asking questions the socratic method disproves arguments by finding exceptions to them in common with socrates bacon stressed it was important to disprove a theory as it was to prove one and real world observation and experimentation were key to achieving both aims so real world observation and experimentation was necessary to both prove and disprove a theory so both bo- both uh, bacon and socrates advocated clever questioning to disprove their arguments both socrates and bacon advocated challenging arguments so clever questioning challenging arguments confirming arguments examining arguments what do you think is the is the word that captures everything examining confirming challenging or cl- questioning but confirming is always you know proving see this is a difficult question people i mean you always have the choice of holding yourself and saying oh, this is difficult but if you look at this way you know examining means what checking it could be right it could be wrong examining gives you the scope of both checking confirming does not i mean confirming means basically i want to prove it but there is point of disproving as well and examining also takes into account what observation and experimentation when you are examining something people don't you examining is more open to observation and experimentation it is more open to disproving and proving both so the word examining is capturing so many things that the other the the other words fail to capture that confirming is just one sided challenging is also just one sided and questioning is also one sided from both sides understand this both sides basically means what both sides means one side you both sides means basically both aims right so that captures both the parties so both proving and disproving come yes both are sides right and wrong so if you prove you have to prove from both the sides i mean see if you prove it then one side is going to basically be on the winning end that is what it says you know may say it's, it's it's a straight forward question there is not much in this in this part of the discussion in this part of the discussion kuch bhi nahi hai because socrates bacon socrates bacon so advocated 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 the only difference is what questioning confirming challenging examining now you have to pick the one that is capturing everything i mean why only disproving it goes out why only disproving i mean i don't see he is disproving they are proving it as well it says here disproved a theory as it was to prove one so both disproving and proving and secondly clever i mean this is just one idea i mean one one side of the entire argument so a will not be there i have to pick from b and d examining is best you see the word captures everything see you are i mean when you are examining something you are using your experimentation you are using see when you sit in the laboratory and you and you and you look at a particular particular you know a uh, thing in a, in a microscope what what are you doing you are examining so when you are examining you have observation you have experimentation you have you have proving you have disproving you have everything no other word captures that and that is the reason why examining is a better word compared to any other word you cannot deny